Hello, it's Jeffo, it's me, Matt, and Amber, and joining us this week is Professor Richard Wolf. How are you doing? Fine, glad to be here. R- Professor Wolf, how did you, what was your uh, road to Damascus moment uh, coming to coming to Marx, your Saul Paul moment? Well, I think it was partly my family. My father and mother were refugees from Europe, came here to the United States to run away from World War II, and... Um, When I was born, my father was pushing a wheelbarrow in the Youngstown, Ohio, sheet and tube steel company. He had been a lawyer in Europe, but when he came here, that counted for nothing. So he was lucky to get any job, and he got a job as a steel worker. And uh, the rest of his life was the denial of being able to do what he had wanted to do. And I think... In one honest way, that shaped me to understand that the world can treat you really badly. And you have to try to understand that. And if if you can think about it, when I used to talk with my father and ask him, you know, what do you think about what's going on? He kind of tutored me in understanding that if the world had been organized differently, there wouldn't have been Nazis and there wouldn't have been war and there wouldn't have been refugees and there wouldn't have been. And I could, I could see, I couldn't put in the words then, but I could see that the way he got through the traumas of his life was by understanding, telling a story to explain why it happened was almost a kind of therapy for him, almost a way of coping And did he talk about these in explicitly political terms? Yes. Yes, he did. And I think he came to politics because he needed to explain this. Mm -hmm. For example, his sister died in Auschwitz, okay? That's a problem. You got to cope with what what does that mean? Picked up off a street of Paris and whisked off and never saw her again. He had to come to terms. And the way he did that, I mean, to deal with that horror, I mean, how do you do that? He... Used his head. He he told the story. He made an explanation, and I think I'm a teacher in part because making an explanation, I could see in my father was his way of coping with life. So part of my coming to Marx was I began to ask the question: Why is the society work the way it does? I did it in high school. I began. I continued in college. I certainly wasn't a Marxist then. Mm-hmm. Anything like it. Um, did, but did you I, study I, economics in, in college? No, I oh, took yeah. one. As a freshman, I took one course in economics. I thought this was the dumbest nonsense <laughs> I had ever heard. I couldn't believe the teacher. I thought it was a joke, and I was waiting for the punchline, but it never came. It was all these lines and graphs. I had been a mathematics student. So I, I wasn't intimidated by the lines and the graphs, but this was childish what was being said. It made no sense at all. So I never took another course in college in economics. Uh-huh. I kept away from it like it was a disease. You know, I didn't want to go <laughs> anywhere near there. I majored in history because I, I could study. I mean, history's everything. Well, history's a story. That's right. Yeah. It's the story. That's right. And I could st- and history is economic history and political history and cultural history. You can do whatever you want. That was exactly what I wanted to study. But the more I studied, the more I understood. Um, if you don't understand what's going on in the economy, you're missing a major part of the story. Mm-hmm. And my teachers didn't didn't deal with it. They didn't handle it. So I, I'm a little bit also shaped, my Damascus, by the kid who can't get the cookies out of the jar. You know, they mm-hmm. become very attractive if yeah. you can't get them. Mm-hmm. So if the teachers are avoiding the economic story, they're avoiding the conflict between employers and employees, masters, slaves, lords, serfs, if all of that is kind of swept under the rug, which it was when I was going to school, then it became even more interesting for me. Why am I being kept from this? Why am I not being told about this? And I had enough people I could ask who gave me a book to read or an article to read, and I began to figure out toward the end of college that we were not being taught what was the most important and interesting stuff. And once you're into that, you find Marx. Sooner so, or later, you find Marx. And then once you sort of walk through that door and like the, 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 that in your mind, the missing part of that story falls into place, like what was it? Like what, what was missing and then what was articulated by coming to Marx 
that the, um, excited you or interested you? The basic thing was, A, that what goes on in the economy, how people make a living is a crucial part of who they are, what they think about, how they relate to other people. And within that, there's a crucial part which has to do with conflict between the employer and the employee yeah. and all of that. And I wasn't being told anything. I was actually being told that there's a wonderful, perfect arrangement in which the interests of the worker and the interests of the employer are the same. Yeah. And they're working together and they're all getting a fair cut of what they do together. It's a happy, happy story. This made no sense to me at all. Yeah, especially since you're reading history and it's all this array of conflict. violent conflict. And you're, well, what are they fighting over? Yes. And if it's all so wonderfully worked out, why did all this conflict happen? What, are they all stupid? They didn't get it? Yeah. You know, they make no sense to me. It really, yeah. at a certain point, I realized I had to do this on my own. I had to go read this stuff and find it, which I did. I wasn't the only one. I had other students who did it with me. But, you know, and I went to, I, I'm a poster boy for elite education in this country. The college I went to where I didn't get what I should have is called Harvard. Yeah. And when I finished, I got my PhD at Yale. I mean, it's like a joke. Yeah. You know, I am the product of all of that. So, you know, I went to the schools that claimed to give me the best possible blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they were terrible in this regard. They were frightened. You know, it was the Cold War. I went to school in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's a time when Americans were scared shitless uh, about the evil empire of the Soviet Union that was associated with Marxism. And the American response really was to make believe it wasn't there, at least in the schools. It was so evil that you wouldn't gonna get near it, wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't teach it. So I'm part of a generation that has no idea what all of that's about. It's so evil that you never, ever get anybody to teach you anything other than how and why to dismiss it, how and why to say it's silly or it's wrong or it's bad. It's really childish. More than, more than bad politics, it's childish, fearful education. You're afraid to talk to the students. You know, I used to say to my teachers, you know, even if you don't like it, the biggest country in the world by population is China and the biggest country in the world by geography is Russia. Those two countries take this stuff seriously. That's enough of a reason for you to teach it. People are going to have to deal with those folks. So why don't we understand how they see the world? I mean, come on. what? what? This isn't rocket science. This ought to be part of the curriculum. They had no answer for me. And I could read in their faces. They were just scared. Later I discovered I was right. They were scared. It wasn't hard to figure out. Your career was over. If you expressed, even in my earlier career. You expressed interest in Marxism and the critique of capitalism. People looked at you as if you had an STD. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they important to keep a good distance or you had the flu or something really bad. Came, whoop, and don't hire you, don't give you a job. You need some sort of uh, academic and professional uh, prophylactic as well to keep it from exactly, spreading. From, <laughs> exactly, to keep the whole thing from getting out of hand. And we don't want one of those the real, I've always had jobs as an academic. I've been a professor all my life. But that's because of another quality of the United States, which is deference to things like Harvard and Yale. I get a job despite my politics mm. because I got a pedigree. And that pedigree in academia counts for a lot. So that's the only use I have for it. I didn't get a very good education. But it's very useful to wave <laughs> the pedigree whenever I get myself into difficulty. It has served me nicely, and I'm, I appreciate it for that reason. But the education, no. We've been talking to you a little bit about how you sort of came to understand Marx and this sort of the, this missing piece of your education that was filled in by uh, Marxism and sort of an understanding of the world that was different from what you had been taught. But I want to I want to go back now to uh, where where this all began at least as it regards you coming on our show. R Professor Wolf, what does the film Boss Baby tell us about contemporary capitalist ideology? <laughs> well, it tells me many things. <laughs> it tells me that underneath the pretense that everything is working out really pretty well, there's a pretty good understanding, as in that movie, 
that there's a lot of bitterness, a lot of nastiness, a lot of struggle, a lot of weird kinds of belief that are widely shared. For me, the best moment in that film uh, comes early when uh, the bad new baby, having arrived, (laughs) explains to the older sibling, who's not quite understanding what's going on, he leans across and he says... There's just not enough love for both of us. You remember that? Yeah. He actually has a theory. He, it's it's got to be a fight to the death between the two little ones because there's not enough. That's what American working people are told. There's not enough money to give you a decent life. So you have to have debts up the wazoo to send your kid to college. You have to do without. You have to, you have to, because there's just not enough It's bullshit in the movie and everyone sees it. And it's bullshit in the economics too, although people don't see it yet. That's my job, is to help (laughs) people see that there's no problem with amount of money and none of that, never was. It's only a question of how you go about using it and dividing it and making it work. If you don't want to, yeah, you can give it all to a few people and everybody else is in trouble. But there's no necessity, that's not necessary, that's not built into anything. It's a political struggle, and you either fight it and win, or you live with resignation. And that's been the lot of people for a long time. So for me, the movie was interesting because it it captured the crazy ideology and showed how it shaped the lives of those two little ones because of the fury of that the older one being displaced and the fury of the younger one wanting to be the displacer and needing an ideological story to tell to make it all sound reasonable and necessary when it wasn't. Also interesting that the boss baby voiced by Alec Baldwin, (laughs) who famously gave voice to, I think, one of the greatest uh, expressions of capitalist domination and sadism in Glengarry Glen Ross. In Which is referenced in yeah. Boss Baby when he says, put the cookie down, cookies are for closers. Yeah. Which yes. was a huge hit with all the eight-year-olds who saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but is a movie like predicated on like the anxieties around scarcity and competition, right. it is kind of interesting that they're like, okay, well, at the end, he does not defeat the baby. He unifies with the baby, and there's solidarity with him and the baby to overthrow the the boss baby bureaucracy, if you will. Yeah, yeah. That, that that that's the thing that sticks with me is how it presents capitalism as like generative. It's like capitalism is inextricable; you can't get away from it. Right. Like it exists before you're born. Right. Like there's a there's, you're born into it. Yeah, there's a factory with with machinery and and bosses in the place where babies are made. And 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 then even the way that it, it imagines uh, like reproduction, like it's the conflict between the babies and the, the the puppies, because in the world of Boss Baby, you only have a kid if you want one, and then like the factory makes a baby for you. So they're literally creating need. It's like they're they're saying that they're not satisfying needs for children or anything. They're creating them. You need it's to go down to Earth to make people want to have the kids. So everything is 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 just in this web of of uh, of production for its own sake and the need to create demand for things that aren't necessarily you know necessary and that that's sort of the 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 generative structure of everything is you need people to consume and you need to if if there isn't enough if they don't need enough then you make them want something and then yeah. you provide that for them. I would use it to teach the economics of advertising because that's what that is. Yeah. The company to make money has to dump the stuff it's produced. It has to have buyers. If the buyers don't want it, don't need it, don't like it, you've got to fix that. And the way you fix it, if you can, is by inundating them with the advertising, playing on their psychological problems to get them to part with their money and buy the damn thing you've produced. That's why in economics it is so crazy when we teach in conventional economics that production happens in response to consumption. Mm. The, the craziness is to assume that consumption is a given. This comes out of your soul and has nothing to do with what? With what you see every day on every billboard, every, you know, in, I, I came here on the subway. To get through the subway turnstile, I had to read the advertisements on the subway's turnstile. Every minute, we all know that, we're inundated with people spending fortunes of money to shape our desires. But in the economics textbook of the classroom, 
production is a wonderful arrangement because it meets our needs, almost as if we need to pretend that the producers are not spending big bucks to shape our needs at every chance they get. Yeah, uh, to go on that, like the, to more in this contrast between uh, the world that exists in an economics textbook and an economics classroom and the world that actually exists where we see the movie Boss Baby and even though we can't quite put our finger on it, we identify with the figure of a tyrannical infant. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how does, like, just generally speaking, like how does the broadly understood, like when people talk about economics or the economy, how does your understanding of that differ from what is overwhelmingly taught in schools and for what like most people, when they think of it, what the idea that's in their head? Econ 101. Econ yeah. 101. Okay. There's a number of ways to get at this. I guess the biggest one for me was and still is that if you look around this society with more or less reasonable open-mindedness, you must see some things. For example, you know that there are some people that are very rich and some people that are very poor. Every community has them. Most Americans know exactly what part of the community they don't go in the evening because you don't go there in the evening. Their parents, when they were young, explained that to them one way or another. We know inequality, and if, if you're here in New York City, as I live, it is so overwhelmingly obvious every day that you, you really have to have a, a cultivated blindness not to see it. I'll give you another example. The instability. I mean, we're now living in the 10th year after a crash, 2008. Kind of everybody knows that. The headlines this week are full of stories that we might be about to have another crash. 75 years ago, we had the greatest crash this system ever had, the 1930s. I mean, crashes are part of it. I used to make a joke in my class that would help students understand if your roommate was as unstable as this economic system, you would have moved out long ago. <laughs> but you accept this. You, you kind of think it's uh, necessary. It's somehow like the rain. You don't like it, but you know, every few days it drops water. But an economic system isn't nature. It's something human beings organize. So for me, I would want economics to talk to me about the great difference between rich and poor. Adam Smith is the founder of this science. He wrote a famous book, The Wealth of Nations. He was interested why some nations are rich and why some are poor. That's me. I, I like that question. I would like it to be answered, and I would like it to be answered honestly. We have a system that produces enormous inequality. It always has. What about that? What about why, why does it happen? And then the logical question, could you have an economic system that didn't do that? In other words... Let's see, let's talk about it, because that's not only interesting as a human being, but it's also very practical. If there could be an alternative that didn't do it, oh, well, why don't we go there? Why don't we do that? These kinds of questions literally were never dealt with in my education. The fancy schools I went to, they didn't do that. In fact, most of the education and economics departments, where I got my education in economics, really had very little to, to do with understanding how an economy actually works, let alone what an alternative might be. They were mostly celebrations. We learned to be cheerleaders, that this capitalist system is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and here's the wonderful way it works, and then everybody stands up at the end and applauds, and those of us that go on to be college teachers are supposed to teach all that junk again. It's so bad, this sort of rationalization or cheerleading for the system, that even the business community in America understands it. Let me explain. Economics is one of the very few fields in American universities where almost every university has two economics departments, not one. The one that's called economics is all about celebrating how wonderful the system is. But over the years, the business community got angry complained. It's very nice. We're glad that you think capitalism is great. So do we. But this is not useful. To a young man or a young woman comes out of here knowing how wonderful it is, but they don't know how it works because you don't teach that. So we're going to set up another track, another economics department, which will be different. It won't be there to celebrate how wonderful it is. You do a good job at that. 
we're going to have another department that teaches people how it actually works. That's called a business school. Yeah. Yeah. And they're usually kept on opposite sides of the (laughs) The campus. campus. That's right. It's a nice long walk. They barely talk to each other. Uh, It's weird. You don't have two history departments. You don't have have two English departments. You don't have two French departments. You don't have two biology departments. But you all have two economics departments. It's so silly that in some universities where they got budget problems, they just collapse the two together to avoid the, the need for double space and double faculty. But it's an admission that economics has been for a long time in this country a cheerleading section in which you teach cheerleading to future cheerleaders who will go around and tell you all of this. That's why, by the way, I mean, among the many costs of this arrangement is a generation of people who, when this system doesn't work well, don't know what to do. Look at it now. They don't know. They can't explain what is going on in the stock market. The explanations are ad hoc and are weird. And you kind of wonder if they understand it so well on Tuesday. How come they didn't think about it last Tuesday? You know what? Bizarre. But that's not really their fault. It's not that they're dumb or anything like that. There's been no education in what's wrong with capitalism. What are the flaws of this system? What alternatives could we have? Because that the Cold War made taboo. We're living in, the, in a country that is still just beginning to crawl out from under that taboo. I think one of the most uh, effective things about that Econ 101 understanding, which is really like the best example of like a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. We were like talking earlier. It gives you just enough information to remain stupid. <laughs> but it, it is very successful because it presents these things, I think like you said a little bit earlier, as natural. That like that these are just law like supply and demand that these are laws like gravity or evolution or things like that 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 that, that our economy is a natural expression of human nature. Well, whenever there was uh, this is going backward, but um, there was a hiring of a few not even what you would consider like far less left economists, but like lefter economists than than the norm at Indiana University, and as a result the business school started to create its own classes, economics for business majors. So right. even if you wanted to learn about economics, you could completely uh, you could completely circumvent the economics department completely. Yeah, the ideology in this country has been very, very strong. And the naturalization, the way you put it, is exactly right. To teach people this is the way the human nature works. Anything, any effort to make it better goes against human nature. When my students raise that, which they always do, I try to tell them stories. I said, you know, when there was slavery in many parts of the world, people were told that it's just natural. Some people are master type people and other people are slave type people. You know, slaves are sort of like children and you wouldn't want to let the children run the the chicken coop, and so they're children, and they wait till they grow up. The problem with slaves is eh, children always, and and that was thought to be human nature, and people justified what they were doing on the grounds that we have to take care of these poor slaves because they're not really fully human. But it was always natural. In, in the Middle Ages, it was natural to be a serf or a lord. In our days, it's natural to be an employer or an employee or any one of the other dichotomies you want. People always who don't want change, who either are afraid of change or can't imagine it, make themselves feel better by saying, well, this is the end of the process of change because we're finally in tune with nature. But you can only believe that if you don't know that every prior system, however different from yours, also thought it was in tune with nature, which once you get it, makes it disappear as a rationale. I kind of wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, Fukuyama and the end of history. It seems like a nice seg there. Yeah, this was one of several comments. It, most of those erupted after 1989. Because, you know, for most of the 20th century, from 1917, 1989, you had the Soviet Union, which held itself out as the alternative, the not capitalist, the, the, the new, the socialist or whatever. And... It was amazing to everybody, including the honest ones over there, that it that it was so kind of surprising that they were able to make a revolution and even to sustain it for the 70 years that they kept it going. Yeah, with a largely agrarian country. Yes, too. very wild. poor, yeah. very backward, all of the problems they had, isolated in the world and all of that. Um, 
But nonetheless, they were there. And, you know, if you're there, you're a fact, and it becomes important. When they collapsed in 1989, when they literally imploded the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe with them, it was not so surprising, if you think about it, that people who had always hoped that they would disappear now said with the typical exaggeration, not only did the Soviet Union disappear, but all of that is no longer relevant. In other words, here is proof that capitalism will be here forever because this great challenge faded or dissolved or went away. And Fukuyama was one. There were many people who wrote in glowing enthusiasm that the history in the sense of a contestation between systems is over. And we are now in the endless realm of capitalism, which has persevered. The poor guy writes the book, and less, literally less than 20 years later, capitalism has collapsed in 2008, which is why books like that aren't written in the last 10 years, because capitalism doesn't look so secure, so clear, so wonderful, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the starkest fact I would start with is that Oxfam in England, you know, the, the institution that does all this research on poverty and that everybody kind of uses, the 1% richest people in the world together own more than the other 99% together own. I mean, you have to go back to ancient Egypt and pharaohs to get this level of, of, of inequality. There's 2,000 billionaires in the world. That's all, just 2,000. Last year, 2017, their wealth went up by $750 billion, just with the stock market and so on. That's roughly seven times the amount of money, it, people say, would be needed to get rid of extreme poverty in the world. We didn't get rid of extreme poverty because people who are already the 2,000 richest people on earth got even richer. What kind of an economic system? No student that I know of, none, being presented with this kind of information wouldn't at least admit it's an important question to, to, to raise. Is this the way we want an economy to work? Is this consistent with our family values, our morals, our ethics, our religions, whatever it is? Most students will have some trouble with that question, would admit at least we ought to be discussing this. This was never discussed in my education. Just was never de deemed relevant. Well, what's what's so amazing is is that one of the foundational, one of those like Econ 101 ideas that's supposed to sort of subvert or refute Marxism is marginal utility, right? And if you, how do you not apply that to people having that much money? Like, what is the marginal utility to these people of like the next hundred billion dollars? Like, it means nothing to them. It could mean literally the difference between life and death for billions of people. And even by your own analysis of like economic value that money is not doing anything for these people they're literally just putting it in a pile <laughs> and there's no connection between well okay if, if this money isn't doing them any good like you've basically said that your commitment to models or whatever has totally superseded any sort of ethic or morality and that therefore them keeping it in this pile is worth more just because to change that distribution would be interrupting these you're talking natural flows, natural economic market. Well, you forces. have to contort reality to fit the theory when, yeah. <laughs> when reality doesn't fit the theory. Well, you know, in, technically when you teach it, you teach marginal utility, and then you, have, you add a caveat, which the textbook has written down always. You cannot compare the marginal utility of one person to another. In other words, you are not allowed by the logic of the model to say that taking a dollar from Rockefeller and giving it to a poor person on the corner moves it from th a low marginal utility, what does Rockefeller care for another dollar, to a person for whom it means a meal or not today. You can't do that. You have to admit that each person has his, her own evaluations, and you cannot interfere with that. That would be violating the person's individual. It's unbelievable. <laughs> In order to preserve this respect for the individual, you'll let the guy starve. It's not that you've superseded it. It is the morality. That's why when you encounter students who've been in these courses enough time, they become little moral monsters because they believe it. It has become 
the lesson that they've, you know, like a, like a young person goes and gets their lessons at church or their catechism class or whatever it is, they learn in school that this, it's natural, it's good, it's, it's the way an economy should work. And it's a short step from there to believing that the CEO who gets $300 million a year really is worth it. He does such wonderful things. He deserves it. Whereas the guy who picks up the garbage in front of your house, he deserves $18 a week. And then you become, you're on the road to what eventually becomes a kind of fascism in which you've assigned people to different gradations in a society, and that's bad enough, but you rationalize it as if it were necessary. Because the end result is is that, you know, this is one of those things where your your common sense would tell you that you humans create a, an economy to serve people's interests, not and, the other way around. And we've and and that ideological process leads you to the point where we exist to serve the market, right. and that therefore morality can enter into it because the morality, as you say, is maintaining these markets. Look, it's very painful with my students to be real honest with you. My students come to me, sit in the office of my because I still teach at the New School University here in New York. And they sit in my office and they ask my advice. Should I take this course or that one? Should I major over here or should I major? They're trying to fit themselves like the round peg in the square hole. They're trying to figure out how to make it in society. For them, they don't even ask the question, wait a minute. I should be doing what I love, what, what means something to me. And I should have a society that gives me the chance to do. They're, they've lost all of that. They make no demands on the system. They're trying to fit in, trying to make sure they can find a place in this existing system because the idea that the system ought to serve them has long ago been lost. It's like sad people who, who can't get the idea that the local politician is supposed to serve you. You're not supposed to suck up to them. That's not the way this was supposed to work. And you encounter those people, you feel bad for them. What's wild to me, though, is that there is that sense that people have you know, are, are so easily taught in a university setting that this person deserves this and this person deserves X. But when you are like, say, trying to organize a wage campaign or something, it's so easy for you to say, your boss makes this much and you make this much. Do you really think that he works harder than you? No one will ever say yes. No one will ever say yes. So there's this weird disconnect be between this kind of you know, intellectual culture around how we view work and wage and all of these very fundamental ideas and what we know to be true from being at work. I agree with you, but let me push back a little this way. It's scary because if you follow the logic of just what you said, then you're going to have to say as your next step, this is outrageous that he gets $20 million and I have to borrow money to put my kids through college. This, and then you're confronted with a very bad injustice of which you are the victim. Unless you are then a mouse, you want to do something. You're now taking a step that makes it harder and harder for you to justify not being active and you're scared for good reason about being a, that's an uncomfortable place for people to be, and I think a good number of them retreat into the acceptance, not because they really believe it, you're right, but because where you're taking them, if you ask them to see what you pointed out, scares them. Well, and rightfully so, it's, yes. it's punished. <laughs> Historically speaking, it is Absolutely. punished. Absolutely. And in subtle ways, their parents, when they were very little and didn't even understand it, taught them, you know... Stand in line when the teacher says it. Do what you're told. That's how, you know, go along to get along. All of that that we've all learned as children, unless we're very unusual, all of that plays in a role here to make it harder and harder. I think if the universities and colleges had a commitment to diversity of, of perspective, the way they now at least say they have with diversity of gender and race and all of that, then we would have had people like me teaching, lots more of them than I am, many like me teaching, and then we would have at least confronted a generation of students with the alternatives that they could have then thought about and made up their own minds. But this country has never in my lifetime had the confidence in its own people to give them real freedom of choice in learning. They've, they've given them a very restricted diet, and we live with the consequences. Well, we, we, we find ourselves now at a point, particularly for young people, people, you know, 
uh, if, if you're like a millennial or you've been, we've basically, as long as I've ever been in a live, we've lived in a society and, and government in which the classical liberal and I guess now neoliberal view of economics is dominant. It's yep. the no alternative, as Maggie Thatcher said. We've been living in this no alternative world, in this end of history world. But then if you're young, one of the formative moments in your young adulthood was the economic crash. So it's sort of like... The, the you know in the 19th century Marx and then they created these ideas and then like the easy history goes then the 20th century discredited many of them but lo and behold here we are in the 21st century and it seems to be making a big comeback in terms of the interest that young people have in an alternative but how do we take like you know what is the next step from taking that the general feeling of disillusionment with the way our society is organized and particularly the economy and how it is disadvantaging you and winnowing down your hopes of a better future. How do, how do you go from there to a coherent political ideology and, and movement in this country? I mean, that's a big question, but where do you start? Well, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but I want to say again, because it has to be said, that it's very sad for the generation of the millennials who are smart enough to engage this crash, not to pretend it didn't happen, are facing the job futures they have, or better yet, don't have, that they were led to expect they would get, but are now being told really isn't there for them. It's really sad that they were never presented with what the alternatives are now that they badly need to figure out where to go instead of simply resigning themselves to a kind of bleak situation that's unfolding. Having said that, I think we have to learn from history. Look, the 20th century, much of the critique of what was done in the name of socialism and communism is perfectly reasonable. A lot of mistakes were made. A lot of bad directions were taken. We have to learn. And we shouldn't be ashamed, those of us that are critical of capitalism, about that. I like to remind people the transition from feudalism to capitalism didn't happen in some smooth way where everybody figured out, hmm, this is not feudalism, not so good, let's do this other. There were all kinds of experiments. Some of them lasted a few weeks, some of them lasted a few months, some of them lasted a few years before they were undone, either by collapsing in on themselves or being destroyed by the feudals who didn't want this new change. Capitalism came into the world after lots of fits and starts and trials and errors. Why do we imagine that it'll be any different going from capitalism to socialism? Russia and China, Cuba, places like that are efforts. And they went, in some ways, they discovered good things. In some ways, they went off the rails in ways we don't want to. We have to learn from that, just like our forebears did. So what do I mean? The big thing in the 20th century of the alternative was the idea of the government, right? The private capitalist system left to itself would produce inequality and instability, and then we would get the government, you see, to come in and kind of fix it, uh, offset the instabilities and counteract. In the 20th century, the formalization of that idea, John Maynard Keynes, with his economic analysis, is how the government can step in this way, that way, and the next way, make it all kind of work out. And the Soviet Union was the ultimate sort of step of that, where the government doesn't just regulate and de- the government takes over to make sure everything goes right. What do we discover? Well, we discovered some things were achieved in that way that couldn't have been any other. I, I like to remind folks that the fastest economic growth in the 20th century of any country was the Soviet Union. They went from a very poor, as you, Amber pointed out earlier, very poor backward, the poorest country in Europe, 1917. They have a revolution. They have a civil war. They lose World War I. A few years later, they go through a horrible World War II. And yet in 1975, they're the number two superpower after the United States. That's an incredible achievement. They were able to go from poor to rich. The best, best example of hey, growth... So the Soviet Union actually ended rationing before the UK did after yeah, World that's, War II. That's right. And the Americans don't even know that we had rationing. The, the fastest growing country in the 21st century is the People's Republic of China. There's nothing comparable to it. So if you want a society to go from poor to rich, they did that. Or at least they did it better than anybody else has ever done it. On the other hand, by giving all that power to the government to fix the economy, you created the risk that they would take that power and do all kinds of things you don't want, which they did. And we have to learn those lessons. I think, to make a long story short, that the problem of the first efforts in the 20th century to go beyond capitalism were to overdo the role of the government, to make it too 
unmoored in the needs of the mass of people, and therefore you got real bad stuff alongside whatever you did achieve. Okay, so then the 21st century now, having learned from that, I think we need to go in a different direction and understand that we can go from capitalism to socialism in ways that have nothing to do with the government, that don't require the government to step in, that don't create the opportunity for the government, but that make the change at a different level, namely at the level that we mostly live our lives, in our homes and in our workplaces. So you may know we we are advocates for worker co-ops, for changing the organization of businesses so they stop being top-down hierarchical arrangements where a tiny number of people, the major shareholders and the boards of directors they elect, make all the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, what to do with the profits. And to change all that and say, no, let's make the workplace, here we go, how, what, here's the idea, democratic. The workplace, one person, one vote, we make the decisions together. We got rid of monarchies because we didn't want the political decisions to be made by a tiny number of people sitting far away in the palace. And we created something else. Why do we permit a tiny number of people sitting in a fancy office that looks like a palace to make those decisions for the workplace? If we believe in democracy, let's democratize the enterprise. For me... That's what socialism in the 21st century is going to be all about. Isn't it hard to do that without the state, though? Like, at some point, this, you know, the state is what they create the laws, the, the framework in which business is conducted. At some point, the state has to intervene, right? Right. But again, I'm going to borrow from history. We had a state in feudal Europe. We had a state with Louis XIV or any of the others. But the change from feudalism to capitalism really didn't happen at the level of the state. It happened first in a thousand little businesses when the serfs ran away from the lord and settled in the town and hooked up in a new way with employers who were also ex-runaway. And you had a, a development from below which eventually confronted the old feudal state by saying, uh, you've got to go, it's... History is over. And when they resisted, they did things like the French Revolution, and they were not nice, and they separated some of these people from their heads and all the rest of that. I'm not advocating that, of course, but you get the picture. I think, yes, you will need the state, but you'll only get the state to do what is necessary for a new system if that new system has some roots, has established yeah. itself, has some power. The it, socialism is not going to come through legalism, I yeah, think is the uh, point. Yeah, and that and that what we've seen is any positive movement in even a progressive direction is always a case where the government is coming in the rear and ratifying change that's happening that's on right. the ground anyway. That's right. Or worse, being used by the powers that be, the old system, to prevent the new, to block the new. You know, when you when you walk, remember, you know, those those heroic for me, those heroic young people in Zuccotti Square, not, not so far from here, you know, they had, remember uh, during the Occupy, and they had those milk cartons, the old plastic milk cartons set up around the perimeter of the park, and everybody who had books brought the books, and they created a free library. They put the books in the milk cartons, and everybody was on their honor. You come, if you want to get a book, you take a book out, take it home, you read it, and then you bring it back. No clerks, no rigmarole, a free library. It was very poignant because it was just at the time that the mayor, Bloomberg at that time here in New York, was cutting funding for public libraries. So it was a beautiful moment of saying, hey, we're in, in favor of libraries. And then the same Bloomberg gets on the television and says, I have to shut this all down. And when the reporters say, why? He says, because they're not clean, the people here. And the reporters, to their credit, looked at him and said, you are the mayor of the filthiest subway, <laughs> of the filthiest subway on this planet, and you're telling us you're shutting down these folks who aren't hurting anybody because they aren't clean? You can't do better than that? Three days later, the bulldozers came in and plowed under those milk crate and cartons with the books. I mean, that's the government coming in and holding on to an old system and being the obstacle. And I don't think you overcome that until you have built the institutional basis that people can see what an alternative might look like and can get excited about going in that direction and demanding the government help them 
rather than seeing a government that is forever under the rubric of law and order and all of that, basically holding back uh, a society that now needs to be changed. Uh, just remembering back to, to Bloomberg and the Occupy Wall Street days, my favorite comment from uh, our former mayor was uh, he said, I don't understand why these people are protesting people who work at banks. They're good people. They make forty grand a year as tellers. And he's done like all the like you made it sound like the people there were like, boo, waiting in lines. We hate this checking account. Why are the pens on those little chains? Give us the pens. Also, I mean, how stupid do you think he must have thought the rest of the people are? This is a billionaire telling us to be happy with forty grand a year as yeah. a bank to- in, I mean, Manhattan. in Manhattan. There's something so nutty about that, did you realize how disconnected from the universe? A couple of weeks ago, uh, Paul Ryan, the, the Republican, got himself into trouble because he was congratulating a lady in Pennsylvania who got a, a dollar fifty increase in her salary per week because of the tax cut. And he was explaining how happy she is because she had <laughs> tweeted something. She how happy she, could she get is! Her Costco she could now. get her yeah. Costco membership. <laughs> This is a guy who got $500 million or something from, from the Koch brothers for his political future, congratulating and saying how happy the lady is with her dollar fifty a week. You know, it's, not, it's not even horrible just that he thinks that way. That's bad enough. But he's comfortable saying it publicly. It takes your breath away. The, the level of not understanding the world in which he lives is frightening. I mean, it's just whoa. It just it shows how little leftward pressure there is. Yeah. They're just not afraid. They don't feel like there's any repercussions because they feel like they have the field to themselves. Yeah, and then he was surprised that that the Twitter universe, you know, blew him away by making fun of what he had just said. Well, then he deleted it and replaced it with an even more offensive. Uh, oh, I missed that. I'm yeah, sorry. what was it? Well, it, apparently it was it it was from the day earlier, but he didn't delete this one, and it was a quote that he highlighted from an article about people responding to their pay raises going up uh, because of less withholding due to the tax bill. And a guy said, uh, yeah, I have a $200 more a month in my paycheck, which will help offset the $300 that my uh, insurance uh, premiums went up. <laughs> so it's still negative 100. It's just going to offset. And he said, quote, they say that the middle class is just getting crumbs, but I'll take it. <laughs> And he just left that up there as proof of how I'll great. take it. <laughs> yeah. Is the, and it's like, yeah. Yes, like, you will. You nice will double. take yeah. every... Yeah. Quadruple yeah. entendre. Yeah. I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'll um, take it. But it, uh, so yeah, back to this idea the fact that, that, that Paul Ryan can say these things in public and he doesn't feel any shame about it. And for the most part, even if we're aghast by it, we all kind of accept it. And I want to get back to this idea. It's because like of this econ 101, these these ideas that have built up in our culture that, that are ridiculous, but we just accept them. And do you remember the old uh, Mad Magazine bit, Snappy Answers to Stupid Questions? We, uh, we came up here with uh, our own, if you could maybe respond to some of these sort of, these, these nostrums, these canard, the econ 101 uh, understanding of the economy and economics. So starting with uh, something you hear a lot all the time, uh, you can't raise the minimum wage because it'll cost jobs. Anytime you raise the minimum wage, uh, that's less money, so they're not going to hire people to begin with. How about that one? Just Well, it, it's wonderful. I, I love that one. I get it in my classes all along. It comes out of the basic supply and demand analysis that young people are taught in our economics classes. And as far as that goes, it is absolutely correct. If you raise the price of anything, there'll be less purchases of it because some people will be priced out. If the, if the ice cream cone in the corner doubles in price, there'll be some people in the neighborhood who are not going to buy ice cream cones, at least not as often as they used to, because it's more money than they can afford. If you raise the price of a worker, there'll be less employers buying their labor than they did before. If nothing else changes... That's true. There'll be a few less people. Now you would have to then weigh, if you raise the minimum wage, the damage to the people who lose their job as a result as against the benefit to the people whose wages are going up as a result of this. Most of the Republican and conservatives forget that second part. They say, gee, there'll be fewer jobs. Okay, there might be. And now we have to ask, what about the people whose minimum has gone up with a rising minimum wage? 
What about them? First of all, we know they're going to be better off because they have more money to spend than they used to for their job that they do. But then we have to follow the little bouncing ball. If the people who have more spend that more, there'll be greater demand for goods and services. And that'll mean employers have to hire more people. Now we have to answer the question, how many more people will they hire to meet the higher purchasing compared to the people they won't hire because the cost of labor is high. We have to work all that out. Bottom line, when you do the act, we actually look at what happens when wages go up, you discover that sometimes they go up and there are fewer unemployed. Other times there are some more. It varies, but there is no automatic situation that dictates if it goes up, you shouldn't, if you raise the minimum wage, you shouldn't do it because some people lose their job. That's just childishly misunderstanding how you do an analysis of this kind. And a good teacher would teach that to their students. The teacher who leaves it at the level of, gee, if the wage goes up, some employers won't hire you, therefore you shouldn't do it. That's a leap for which neither logic nor economics provides any justification. And you don't have to be a left wing to do that, anybody who understands the theory would teach the students that. Here's another one. This is this is a, a one you hear a lot, and it's it's one of my favorites. How about the idea that the government should run its budget like a family? Mm. Right, right. The government should run its budget like a family. Like we shouldn't overspend. You know, we have an X amount of money for the month, and we can't go above that. And we have we have to we have the money we have to divide up. If we go over that, our checking account is going to be overdrawn. So. Like I said, there's, there's a certain logic there that seems to make sense, but why is this phony? Well, it's phony for so many reasons. It kind of takes your breath away. Let's start. Anybody who's in a family in the United States today, or almost anybody, understands that there are very important things that a family needs to do which require them to spend more money than they have. Let me give you a couple of examples. Most American families understand that their children will have a better future if they have a college education than if they don't. But they don't have the money to spend the roughly $200,000 more or less that it now costs to send your kid to get four years of, of college. So guess what they do? They spend more than they have. How do they do it? By borrowing. And they do it because of the confidence that even though it's burdensome to have a debt, that's less of a loss to you than forgoing a college education for your children. So they do it. The government is exactly the same. The things the government needs to do that it doesn't have the money for, it will sometimes borrow because it's more important to have that result with a debt than to avoid a debt and not have that result. So the notion of an equation doesn't break down when you say, gee, it ought to behave like a family because families are going into debt all the time. The average American family now has more than $100,000 in debt. If you add up the mortgage debt that they carry, the automobile debt that they carry, the credit card debt that they carry, and the college student, those are the four major kinds of credit in our society, then the average American family is borrowing like there's no tomorrow. We couldn't have people in their own homes if they didn't borrow. Do we believe in a home ownership society? Every president for the last 50 has said we believe in it. Well, the only way Americans can afford a house is if they borrow. So if you believe that it's valuable to have people in their own home, then they have to spend more than they earn. The same logic applies to the government and should be understood in those terms. The difference with the government is that the money it gets is not, by and large, from the production it carries out. For a working-class family, right, if you go to work, you do a job, you get paid. The government does some of that, does some production, but most of its income comes by taxing. So the real issue is that the government goes into debt because it doesn't raise enough in taxes. If it did, it wouldn't have to go into debt. So my response to people who say the government shouldn't borrow in excess of spending, I agree. It should tax the money. And who should it tax it from? Well, you can guess where I would go. <laughs> it should tax from the people who have the most money to pay. The rich and the corporations should be taxed. And here's the punchline, if you allow me. When you cut the taxes of corporations and the rich, the way we did in December of 2017, 
you create, of course, the need for the government to borrow. Unless the government is prepared to cut the spending on everything, schools, hospitals, roads, and everything else, how is it going to get by having cut taxes on corporations and the rich as much as they did and still be able to spend what they have to spend? The answer is they have to borrow. And here comes the punchline. Who does the government borrow for, from, in order to keep going after cutting the taxes? The only people who can lend the money to the government are the corporations and the rich who lend to the government the money that they used to pay in taxes. That's why it's the biggest hustle since sliced bread. Because by cutting the taxes, the government has basically said, instead of taxing it from you, we're going to borrow it from you, <laughs> well, this- pay you back, and pay you interest while we wait. This is a system designed by the devil to solve problems of the government by making the rich even richer. This That's gets the real the, issue. This is this is the perfect segue into my the last of these canards. This is the last one here is moving out of sort of econ one hundred and one ideology into the harder stuff. We're getting now into the real free base of libertarian <laughs> ideology, and that is this is this is a great phrase. I'm seeing it more and more these days. Taxation is theft. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that that the, gov- you were, the government is stealing money. All these people that, that you wanted to tax, the rich people and corporations, the government is using their implicit m- monopoly on force to threaten the most productive people and to, to literally rob from them, to take their money f- out of their pocket at gunpoint. Every effort of a private capitalist society for the last 300-odd years that we've had capitalism as our system has given to the government an enormous role in doing all kinds of things that they, the capitalists, either can't or don't want to do themselves. Defense, a judicial system where they can resolve their disputes without shooting at each other, and a whole host of other activities. Unless you allow the government to organize itself as an enterprise selling goods and services which capitalists have not wanted them to do for fear of the competition that would come from them, then there's no alternative but to tax the people somehow to raise the money to have a defense, to have a judicial system, to have a public works program, roads, and all the rest of it. So you can call it any name you want. You can call it theft. That just means you don't like it. But unless you have some alternative way to get these collective goods done, you know, the public park and the highway and the defense and all the rest of it, unless you have some other alternative that you've never told us about, then calling the taxation a theft is neither here nor there. It's in, you're playing with the words. And I can play with those words too, to give you an example. I can show you that the cost of producing an automobile is somewhere in the neighborhood of twelve or $13,000. Well, then why are we charged 25000 It's theft, I could call it. (laughs) It's theft. Why should I? I mean, I can do this. I can do this same silly game. That company, that Ford or General Motors or any of the others, isn't satisfied with getting the amount of money back for selling the car that it costs to produce it. They want to pay for the advertising to get you to buy it. They want to expand their production. They want to try robots. They have lots of other expenses. So they jack up the price in order to cover the rest of what they do. But that's no different from what the government does is raise the money in taxes to do what they are called upon to do. Calling it theft just means you don't want to pay. The same people who say that about the government would be shocked if they heard me explain that a third of the price of everything you buy is theft. (laughs) You schmuck. How come come you're not complaining about being ripped off every day in the supermarket? By the way, Americans would buy that because most Americans feel ripped off in the supermarket. They feel ripped off, but I think they would say that, like, well, no one's forcing you to buy the car. You just live in a society where you have to have a car to have a job (laughs) or to do anything. No no one's forcing you to go to the supermarket to buy food either. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. uh, Unless you grow a lot in your backyard um you are by your life forced to yeah i guess just like the thing like broadly now like we're sitting here uh in 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 brooklyn in 21st century america what do you think what does it mean to consider yourself a marxist in 21st century in america and is it different than if we had been we're, we're in 19th century europe like, yeah it, it is different i mean let me an- answer the first part um I'm a critic of capitalism. All for me Marxism means is 
I've lived in capitalism all my life. I was born in the United States. I've lived all my life in the United States. I'm a citizen. I think I understand this system both in terms of living in it and studying it all my life. And I think that basically we can do better than capitalism. Just like the world did better than slavery and feudalism, we can do better than capitalism. And I have no reason in my life to shut my brain down or to shut my critical capacities down at, at capitalism as if it didn't deserve the same criticism that I would give to a school system I thought we could do better than or a transportation system or an energy system. I feel kind of proud of Americans. I really do that we're critical. I mean, we even having a debate these days about what is marriage, what is gender. Oh, good. Those things should be questioned. Why don't we question capitalism? What is it about capitalism that it gets a pass? And my judgment is you give a pass to an institution in your society for 50 years the way we've done, it rots. It doesn't work real well because criticism is how you identify flaws and mistakes, maybe even fix them, maybe even figure out how to do better. We should have been doing that for 50 years. We haven't. So for me, I'm a Marxist because I'm a critic of capitalism. And if you are a critic of capitalism and you take it seriously, which I do, then you find your way back to Marx and Marxists because it's the most developed school of criticism of capitalism we have. Marx starts in the middle of the 19th century and he's basically saying, I thought capitalism was going to be the wonderful thing everybody promised. Karl Marx, and there's a film, by the way, you can see these days, the young Karl Marx yeah, mm -hmm. so circulating. It, right. And it's actually, I, I've seen it now, it's, it's actually it's pretty good, you know, all things considered. Um, so Marx is, grows up in the wake, in the German wake of the French Revolution. The slogan's there, liberty, equality, fraternity. He believed all of that. He welcomed this new world where we would have liberty, equality, and fraternity. You could add democracy. The, but he's a little later, you know, he's 50 years after the French Revolution. He looks around Germany, which is where he comes from, and he says, uh, we got capitalism, which promised liberty, equality, fraternity. We got the capitalism. But the liberty, uh-uh. The fraternity, not even close. And, you know, equality, don't, don't make me laugh. It's, it's full of inequality. So he, he says, what's, what happened? What went wrong? It's almost as though you could say he felt that the revolution had been betrayed in some way. Not by some people, but it didn't achieve what it set out. And he said, I, I'm, my contribution, I'm going to figure out why that was. Make a long story short, his conclusion was capitalism is not the vehicle that brings liberty, equality, fraternity. Capitalism is the obstacle. Capitalism thought it was different, but it isn't. In the past, we had master slave, lord serf. Employer, employee isn't the end of that. It's just another form of that. And that's the problem. And we have to break out of that. That's why I advocate for worker co ops. It's no more them and us, it's the workers themselves running their own enterprise. They are their own bosses. It's a different kind of universe. And for me, the Marx, it, I answer the question are you a Marxist? Yes because I want to kind of push back against people who think that I should disassociate myself. I don't. Does everything Marx say make sense? No. Does he make mistakes? You betcha. He's not uh, a mythical figure, but he is the guy who started this whole thing. And I read him with the same respect that I use when I read Adam Smith or David Ricardo, because they also understood a lot of things I need to, to grasp. It's just they were partisans of the system, and Marx was a critic of that system. And that's why I'm a Marxist. And that's all it means that he can teach me, for example, that the, the break we need is to get rid of the top and the bottom, to get rid of the hierarchy and the, the structure of a capitalist enterprise by a collective democratic way of organizing production for the same logic that made us get rid of monarchies and dictatorships in the political sphere. We should have done it long ago. But to this question of what it means in the 21st century, if, if Marx described capitalism a class-based system of power, obviously the circumstances have changed a lot. Maybe a lot has remained the same, but like, I, I'm just more interested like in... Marx's classical understanding of what a worker and working class was, who like who fits that definition in 21st century America? Because obviously, like the the workplace has changed dramatically from the times in which 
Marx was writing. I guess I would argue a bit with you here. I don't think it's changed. I mean, the technology has changed, of course, and the, the particular ways we do our work and the, the machines and computers and robots and all the rest of it have changed. But that was true across Marx's lifetime. The technological changes from the beginning of the 19th century to the end struck those people as unprecedented. I mean, they had steam engines at the end. They didn't really have them at the beginning, They, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not so impressed, I guess that's the best way to put it, by the technological changes because they didn't alter the basic human relations. And that's what Marx was always interested in. He wasn't interested in the details. He was interested in how human beings interacted with one another in production. And the notion that some people give all the orders and some people are in charge and everybody else comes to work, does what they're told and goes home and watches TV, this relationship of, between people is for him the problem out of which the conflicts come and out of which the contradictions of the system and its flaws come, which is why he wants to change it. So to answer your question simply, most Americans right now in the United States are perfect examples of the working class of people as Marx defined it. And, and let me just explain it in the way that I think might work. If you're looking for a job and you sit down, you go to find a private employer. Most Americans work for private employers. You sit down, you have a conversation with this person, human relations person or the human resources, the way we call it these days, the boss. And you talk about all the different things about the job and then you get to the, the tough part. How much am I going to get paid? And the employer says, for example, to you, well, I'm going to pay you, I offer you $20 an hour. And let's say you agree, I'll work for $20 an hour. You know something now, but you repress it. This is Marx's argument. Here's what you know. The only reason that employer will ever give you $20 every hour that you come is if what you help him to produce, what you help make, the good, the service, is worth more than $20 for every hour that you work. Why? Because if what you produced was $20 worth of extra stuff for him to sell, he'd sell it, get the $20, pay you, and what's he get? He didn't get squat, nothing, zip. So the only way you get a job in capitalism, in a private employment, is if you produce more during each hour of your labor than you are paid. Which means what you have to face, which is so hard for Americans, is that the notion that you would never work for anybody who doesn't pay you what you're worth means you don't understand the system in which you are trapped. You always are ripped off. That's why those days when you walk home from the job and stop at the happy hour on the way to make yourself feel better, you're right. You don't just feel ripped off, you've been ripped off. The worker always produces more because that's the only basis on which the employer will give him or her a job. This situation is the situation of the American working class, and it either accepts it as inevitable, natural, or any other excuse it wants, or it sets itself as, like me, a critic of a system. Why in the world does it work like this? Why aren't we collectively producing more than we pay ourselves, but we, as owners, operators of the collective worker co-op, we decide what's done with that extra rather than passing it off to another person who enriches himself that way and thereby guarantees that next week, next month, next year, we will be in the same situation. I don't get enough to get out of this trap. He makes the surplus, as Marx would put it, which keeps him in that position, and that's how capitalism reproduces itself. So I would argue that's why Marx is relevant, because he teaches this lesson, and from that much understanding of the system flows. I think that's a great note to end That's a great way to end it, I think, yeah. Like, yeah, just the, yeah, if there is like a future way forward, it's people just confronting that sense of being ripped right. off, because... Putting it Collectively. in the yeah, putting it in and putting it in terms people can relate to because we are, and I think this, I think we all we are all so obsessed with getting ripped off, right. and we think that like welfare queens are ripping us off, right. or we think that like our the guy the used car lot is ripping us off, and it's all like we're sublimating 
our sense that we're getting ripped off at work, the alienation that happens with work, right. and we can't confront it because it's too dangerous. That's right. So we sublimate it, and we're so and we're obsessed with getting ripped off everywhere else but right. the place where our fundamental ripped, ripped off and this is happening. Right. right. And like, if there's a future... You know, it's like it, the person who's miserable at their job comes home and kicks the dog. Yeah. Right? The dog had nothing to do with it. The dog is innocent, but you can't confront how miserable you are at the job because that's scary. You need the job. So you kick the dog who's going to come up and love you anyway, <laughs> which is why you got that dog. You know, <laughs> you get... Yes, it's, it's, and it's a, it creates, of course, and this is Marx's point a lot of the time, it creates a very unhappy society and a lot of unhappy people because they can't confront what really bothers them. Then they behave in a way which somewhere they know is irrational and crazy too. Right? They're confronted, they get angry at the welfare queen, and then the next week someone tells them about a person on welfare, what their lives are really like, and they kind of have a moment where they realize, gee, it doesn't quite square with what I thought of myself as a person. It's a society that is messed up by its inability to confront what Marx calls exploitation, this business where you produce a surplus for somebody else rather than for yourself. Try to imagine, you know, the Marxist image here. It's Christmas. It's a party, a Christmas party for all the workers. The employer gets up on a rickety table because he's Jack drunk. In, can I use your apartment? I need to have an affair. <laughs> right. No, he gets up and he's <laughs> drunk. And he, th he thanks everybody. All the people have gathered for their Christmas party. So I want to thank you all. You worked so hard. You made this a very successful year where our profits were whatever. In that moment, this drunken employer recognizes that everybody contributed to the profits of that company. He doesn't ask himself the question, if they all help to produce it, why are they all excluded from deciding what happens to what they help to produce? How is it that I and three other people will make the decision what to do with the profits that they, that they help to produce? There's no, how come they're not mad at me? And the answer is, <laughs> it's your point. Yeah. They feel ripped off from something. And they may not be able to say it to him. They may not even be able to say it to themselves. But it doesn't go away. Every lesson of psychology teaches you that that sits there and it festers and it messes up much of the rest of the society's life and interrelationships. Very hard. You know, not to be overly dramatic, how do you formulate a loving relationship with another person? If you're constantly either in the position of ripping off or being ripped off, you really think you can separate yourself into airtight compartments? What you do with your boyfriend or your girlfriend is not affected by the bitternesses and the unresolved tensions of the rest of your life? Don't be crazy. That's why so many people can't have emotionally equalized relationships with other people. They don't know what that is. They never encountered it. They live in a world which doesn't work like that. And they know that somewhere, but they can't apply it. If we taught them, if we allowed the Marxism, the insights to be taught so that people could think about whether they were relevant, whether they helped understand life or not, then I think we would have been much, much further ahead. The loser in this country from closing us off to Marxism has been this country in many, many ways. It wasn't smart, it was a fearful and a fear-driven uh, reaction, a childish one, you don't overcome an idea by pretending it isn't there. You know, three-year-olds, three-year-old children, when they're confronted by a scary dog, put their fingers in front of their eyes because they imagine that if I can't see the dog, the dog isn't there. It takes a while to mature to get to the point to realize, mm, the dog is still there even if I go like this. American colleges haven't progressed that far. They thought if they put their fingers in front of it. And the joke is, we now have a new movie about Karl Marx, which, by the way, portrays him very simple. He's the hero of the movie. He's very sympathetic. You're he's beginning young. to he's see. He's hot. He's <laughs> Karl Marx. What? He's young. He's hot. He's That's Karl right. Marx. That's right. So uh, I think uh, we can just say uh, it's 21st century America. Um, the dog is still there. Yeah. It's still <laughs> scary. <laughs> The dog is still barking. Yeah. Professor Richard Wolf, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. I had a good time. Thank you. Great. For our, our listeners, uh, if they are interested in anything you've had to say and would like to know more, uh, where should they go? Well, 
two places I would urge them to consider. The first is a weekly one-hour radio and television show called Economic Update. You can find it on YouTube and the Internet in an easy way. Uh, you can get it as a podcast in, in all the usual ways, a regular weekly show that goes into the economic analysis, the Marxist alternative, and so on. And the other thing is we have chapters around the country, roughly 20 of them now, that work on this transition to worker co-op-based economy away from the hierarchical things we've been talking about today. And again, if you go to the website of our organization, Democracy at Work, which is real simple, democracyatwork.info, uh, you can find out all about the action activities of these groups. And we're always looking for people who might want to Join with us and do this. We will put the links to those in the show's description. Right. Once again, Richard Wolf, thank you so much for your time. And thank you all for being here and engaging in this conversation. Uh, before we leave you this week, we would just like to remind you once again that our book, The Chapo Guide to Revolution, a manifesto against logic, facts, and reason, is available for pre-order at fine booksellers everywhere. Please check it out. Uh, pre-order if you're interested and help us Spread the chaos and reach number one. That's all we care about, being number one. If I'm not number one, probably not going to love myself or anything else. And also, new tour dates added in the cities of Portland, Seattle, and San Francisco. If you did not get a ticket to the first shows, there are new dates. We're doing second shows in all of those cities on our West Coast tour in March. Check chapotraphouse.com for sales information. It will be in the information text box for this episode. Uh, tickets still available in Los Angeles, but they are going quickly. So again, if you try to get tickets for us in Portland, Seattle, or San Francisco, new shows have been added. So check it out. Until next time, see ya.